My old boss used to come in every morning and he would say, the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> and I think we humans have lost track of the most important thing. I think we've lost track of what it is we're actually trying to do. What are we optimizing for? I think we need to really think about redesigning, re-architecting the very architectures that hold us together and how we live together. And I think there's no better place to start than with place itself. And I'm going to talk about all of this through the lens of this particular place that Chris talked about called Fogo Island, which we say is far away from far away. It's off the northeast coast of Newfoundland, which is off the northeast coast of Canada. It is one of Canada's oldest communities. It was first settled by English and Irish people about 400 years ago, other than the indigenous people who have been there for time out of memory. It's small but not tiny. It's about 300 square kilometers, so four times the size of Manhattan. And on this little island live 2,500 people. I tell people I'm 61 years old, and I have lived in three centuries, and I am not a vampire. <laughs> and I say this because I was born and raised on Fogo Island. I'm an eighth generation Fogo Islander. Until I was 10, I really lived in the 19th century. We had no running water, no electricity, no health care. My parents couldn't read and write. It was a perfect life, unless you had a toothache, because there was no dentist either. When I was 10, and I'm going to talk about this, the worst of the 20th century came down on top of us in the form of the industrialization of the fishery. And we were a fishing community and had been for 400 years. And my career was in wave division multiplexing, which are the tiny little optical components that have enabled the digital age. So that's the third century. And I think the centuries are going by in decades. So I'll probably see a few more centuries before it's all said and done. Um, no one's really heard of Fogo Island before. I, I saw very few hands go up, and I know there are at least a few Canadians in this room, um, until this happened. Fogo Island was born into modernity because of design. This is the inn that Chris talked about. It is a part of a whole set of initiatives that I'm going to talk uh, with you about today, which are very design-centric. And this inn opened in 2013, so it's still kind of a baby. And this is the Trojan horse. It's a Trojan horse for a set of dreams and ideas about how we might live together better as humans. And the hero of this story is a little thing called community. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, every time I say Fogo Island, I'm expecting that you're going to fill in the name of a community that means something to you. And if you don't have one, you have to go out and get one right away. Because it, if that's the lens that you see the world, I can promise you, you're going to have a better life. And a question for for communities and for people as well, is we have managed to create this big slippery ball that is moving super fast, that it's very difficult to belong to. Communities around the world, especially small ones, are falling out of the story of the world every single day. That's actually not necessary. I think we have created for ourselves a crisis of meaning. And I think that crisis of meaning is in some way tied to a crisis of value because I think we've lost track of what is the relationship between the inherent value of something or the intrinsic value of something and its financial value. And that's what we have to fix. I don't think it's all that hard. I'm a big fan of this man, E.F. Schumacher, who wrote a book a long time ago called Small is Beautiful. If you haven't read this book, you must read this book. He's not advocating that everything has to be small. He's just advocating that we should get too big by starting with small and networking them together intelligently. And so I, I'll use a few Schumacher sentences. Nature and culture are the two great garments of human life. Of course they are. I've never met a human being that disagrees with this. I meet lots of people that don't act as if it's true. 
and business and technology are the two great tools that can and should serve them. I'm not a designer if I'm anything. I would say I'm probably an accountant. But I think design is like accounting. We have all become handmaidens of business. When we really need to be handmaidens of life, and good businesses, and there are lots of good businesses, and I think more, there will be more, they are also handmaidens of life. So if we act as handmaidens of life, then business and technology will be great tools of nature and culture. And so what are we optimizing for, any of us, when we get up in the morning? Imagine how the world would be different if we all optimize for some notion of human community. Now, I need to talk about a definition here. When I say community, I mean a physical embodied place where human beings live in some kind of a tangle with each other. Communities are really the only site of care and I would say real collaboration. Communities are places that people have shared memories and shared aspirations. Now, there are brand new communities. In fact, I think there are some temporary encampments on this planet that people have no shared memories in and probably will be in those places for a long time, but they have shared aspirations and a shared fate, F-A-T-E. Contrast a community with a network. Networks are hugely important things in all of our lives, and if used properly, and most of them, not all of them, are digital or live on a digital platform, can help strengthen communities. Where I think we get into trouble with humans is we spend, unless you people are cleverer and have figured out more than 24 hours in a day, we only have a certain number of hours. If we dedicate our time to our networks that are online, that leaves not so much left over for the communities. I once made a talk actually in Toronto and the fellow said, well, you're lucky because you live in a community. I don't. I said, well, where do you live, the moon? He said, no, no, I live in Mississauga. It's like, okay, but aren't there communities in Mississauga? He said, well, no, nobody really knows each other in my neighborhood. I said, well, that could start with you. Just go next door and say, hello, I'm the man that lives next door. Making a community is as simple as that. And so, I love the work of a South Korean urban planner named Gil Chin Lim. He died too young, but he coined the phrase humanistic globalization. Of course, globalization. We all want to be together, and we are together on this planet. However, his call was to create a global network of intensely local places. You do not want to come to Toronto and find Seoul. You don't want to go to Chicago and find Vancouver. And I think that in our work, whether me as an accountant or you as designers, we have contributed to a flattening of the specific. And that is not necessary. Okay, in all my business life, I was never came across this idea of sacred capital. This is from the work of a fellow named Charles Eisenstein. Something is sacred in his language if it carries a unique essence that, if destroyed, can't be easily repaired. All these things named here. Sacred capital is important to our human ability to make a dignified life. And then there's money, which is hugely important, but not sacred. And the thing we have to get right is the relationship between financial capital and sacred capital. And I think we're living through a time where we overvalue money. And we, what, are we, what we use it for most of the time is to make more money. And the last thing we need on this planet is more money. In fact, I think the fact there's so much money looking for a return that we are at risk of damaging even more of the sacred capital. And so I think money can do almost anything we ask it to do. We just have to ask it. So let's go to Fogo Island. There it is off the northeast coast of Newfoundland. 10 little communities that uh, people settled 400 years ago, fishing communities. We mostly um, came all around the same time. 
uh, the vernacular architecture of the region has all to do with the ocean. We have our backs to the land, our faces to the sea, and we fished in small little boats. This building that you see there, where the man is getting out, that's called a fishing stage. And I want you to pay attention to it because it'll come back in the presentation a little bit later when you start to see the contemporary architecture. Lots of seabirds and whales and caribou. We have seven different seasons on Fogo Island. Like one of the most dangerous things that we humans can do is fail to think about things very carefully. When we got tangled up with the mainland, my father said, he heard people talk about four seasons. He thought that was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. It's like, why do, you, why do people accept that there are four seasons? That's clearly not true. And he thought there were 17 seasons, which all had to do with what he was doing in that different times of the year. We've settled on seven. This is pack ice season. This is multi-year ice that comes down from the coast of Greenland. And I have to tell you, we know it's melting because we see what comes down. Every year, more and more, after the pack ice comes, this is in, say, April, April, May, then the icebergs come. These are bits of glaciers that have fallen off and come down because Fogo Island is located in the Labrador Current. And the thing about place, I want to say, is every place is special. That's not what's important. What's important is that it's specific. And this idea that we should be strengthening the specificity of a place, because that's where knowledge lives, is something that I think we have to hold on to. So growing up on Fogo Island is to grow up like this. We grew up feral, and we still grow up feral. You can be sure those kids know when the tide's coming in. How many people, you don't have to raise your hands, how many people in this room know the phase of the moon right now? I bet not so many. The moon controls everything. It controls our very bodies. But we humans have retreated so far from the natural world that we don't even pay attention. I don't know who said this, but I thought it was good. If the stars only came out every thousand years, we'd go out and look at them. OK, pitcher plant is the uh, provincial flower of Newfoundland. It's a carnivorous plant and a little tour around the communities. When people came from Europe, well, first, of course, people know about Christopher Columbus, who came from Europe in 1492. Fewer people talk about John Cabot was sailing in 1497 from Bristol, and he was looking for India. And he bumped into Newfoundland. And he sent a letter back to the king that said, Sire, the fish are so plentiful, they stay the progress of my ships. He had found one of the biggest populations of fish in any ocean. And it's this fish, the North Atlantic cod. You just need to take my word for the fact this is the most superior fish in any ocean. It has more protein than any other fish. And then any of you come from uh, Portugal or Spain or France, it's bacalao. It's the one that we salt. And uh, it has shaped many, many, many cultures of the North Atlantic and of, I would say, Brazil and, and probably the Caribbean. So this is what we did for all those years. And buildings like this are hundreds of years old, simple little wooden structures that have endured. We fished like this, tiny little wooden boats, close to land. I don't actually know who the, th these men are. All the pictures, by the way, are from Fogo Island. Um, this one is from Placentia Bay. I don't know who they are, but I do know that they're related to each other. They would have made their own boats, made their own nets, and look how close to shore they're fishing. That cod trap that they're using, that net, is attached to the shore by a rope called a shore fast. And so the foundation that we set up that owns this inn is called shore fast. It's a metaphor for may we always be shore fast here in this place. We did this for 350 years. And then this happened. At a time that Canada had a 12 mile fishing limit, you could go up on the hill behind our house and see dozens of these things, monster factory ships. It took no time at all to bring the cod to the brink of ecological extinction. This was 1968, I was 10 years old. It, what it meant was people like my father, who was a seventh generation Fogelweiler, everything he knew, which, and his knowledge is original knowledge, his knowledge was from nature, overnight was useless. And he never understood what happened, but it, and nor did any of us at the time. But what it caused was a, a collapse, really, of the inshore fishery that we were a part of. The government of Newfoundland passed a resettlement program. 
that basically said all those little communities around the coast of Newfoundland, hundreds of them, had to move into the bigger areas. It was a kind of a forced resettlement. There's a song about this time, it's, and, the, and the two lines are, they moved without leaving and never arrived. And when I think about the 60 million people that are wandering around the planet right now, that not much has changed. In any event, folk, we always move our house when we move, by the way, because our houses just sit on little wooden shores. This didn't work this way on Fogo Island. We didn't resettle because of art. Because the, the National Film Board of Canada, more specifically, which came to Fogo Island in the late 60s and made 27 beautiful little films in a participatory film process that you can look, if you Google this, you'll see these films. It changed how we saw who we were. It changed how we saw our assets. And it changed how we saw each other. So that's what convinced me at the age of 10, that if you have a really tough problem to solve, bring on the artists, because they're like reverse magicians. Magicians make things disappear, artists make things appear. They point to things we don't ordinarily see. As a direct result of this process, Fogo Islanders formed a cooperative. That little fishing co-op, to this day, owns the fishery on Fogo Island, and we found a way to stay, we adapted to other species of fish. And I can tell you with great certainty, if our fishery wasn't owned by a cooperative, we wouldn't be living on Fogo Island today and I wouldn't be here talking about Fogo Island. So as business people, and I don't know how many of you identify as business people, I do, we lack many things. And one of the things we lack is a little bit of imagination and we lack nuance. If you need to run a fishery on a little island off the coast of Newfoundland, a small community-owned co-op will do the job just fine. We don't need a publicly traded transnational fishing company. If you want to drill for oil and gas off the coast of Newfoundland, bring on the transnational capital. So it's getting the right business solution for the size of the problem that you're trying to solve. Anyway, the co-op still exists, and it's one important leg of our economy. We've adapted to crab as our main species, so that means we have to get out through the pack ice because that fishery starts in April. Not an easy way to make a living. To go back to my father, at the time all this was happening, he used to say, well, who in their right mind would fish day and night until all the fish are gone? Like, that just makes no sense. Finally, before he died, he said, maybe they're turning the fish into money. Indeed. So he insisted that I study business. So I went away to university, and I studied business because he said, you need to understand what is the ideology that is controlling those decisions that, that are being made about those fishing boats. So it, I think when we think about design, and I, as I said, I'm a, I'm a business person, we don't often think about what it is we're measuring or designing for. So as accountants, for example, we, we put out balance sheets and income statements that give pretty meaningless, useless information. This is a European organization which actually has taken a first stab at how do you make a balance sheet that reports against the things you value and for all the stakeholders. This is directionally accurate. It will get better with time. Um, so I did not learn this in business school. But I did learn this in business school because I got a part-time job working at a grocery store. And I saw, for the first time in my life, a cauliflower. And I realized, wow, this is a beautiful fractal, right? It's a pattern that repeats and repeats and repeats. Fogo Island is like one of those tiny little florets. Ottawa, where I went to school, is a bigger floret. Beijing is a bigger floret. All these florets are where we live. They're held together by the stem. The stem has two jobs to do. Number one job, hold us all together. Number two job, bring nutrition to the florets including economic nutrition. And I think we're living in a time that our economic system doesn't allow nutrition to come to the florets. So that is a design problem. So this is a great analogy. We love this cauliflower analogy so much that we've made little lapel pins for cauliflowers. It's a metaphor for thinking whole. Of course, Schumacher himself had a better way of saying it. He just said, our task is to look at the world and see it as whole. So for everything we do, we have to think about all of the impacts. 
All of this is in Small is Beautiful. You just have to read it, and I promise it's small. Um, this is the foundation that I set up with my brothers about 12 years ago. I moved home with the idea that we're going to grow another leg on the economy and do it in a way that strengthens culture. Shorefast is a registered charity of Canada, but I'm super interested in business. I'm very interested in social business. And so we are guided by a poem. And actually, this is what I think all of us humans are trying to do. The art of walking upright is the art of using both feet. One is for holding on, hold on to who we are, what we know, where we've come from, and, it's always an and, reach out and belong to the world. We're not building walls. We're actually reaching out. And I think this is the motion that businesses should be doing as well. We practice what's called asset-based community development. Nobody, no person, and no community has ever built a future based on what they don't know and don't have. Asset-based community development takes you through a series of questions. What do we know? What do we have? What do we love? What do we miss? And what can we do about it? And if you went through such a process, and we could do this for any community on the planet, and I'm telling you the only communities we can't save are the ones that nobody loves. But if somebody loves a place, we could do this using this methodology. On Fogo Island, it would lead you immediately to realize that this is a culture that is genetically and culturally predisposed to profound hospitality, which is why we settled on doing an inn. This is how we're organized. So the Shorefast is the charity of Canada. We operate the social businesses that are on the far side. The inn is the biggest one. We have a little fish business. We have a furniture business and a community host business. We target 15% profit because they're social businesses. Profit's a good thing. It's just a question of how much. We take that profit, goes back to the charity, and then we invest it on the other side. All of those initiatives have to do with knowledge. Preserving knowledge, adding to knowledge, sharing knowledge. The biggest program we run is the artist in residence program, and we also have design residencies. I'll talk about that. These are the things we believe in. Community is the basic building block of human life. We just have to find our way back to it. Place itself is not a commodity and shouldn't be treated as a commodity. To be respectable of all of the human ways of knowing, if you want to know what this man thinks, you don't send him an email. You actually get tangled up with him and it'll take a little time. Art is a way of belonging to the world. We've invested heavily in art and we believe in art. I started saying this 12 years ago. All business must be not just for profit. At the time, I think that the deeply corporate people were rolling their eyes, at least inwardly. I don't think anybody rolls their eyes at this anymore. I think we all know that if businesses are just for profit, little Greta is gonna be, will need a lot of little Gretas, let's put it that way. This is not that hard to do, actually. Life is a rhythm of opposites. We need to acknowledge that. It's not a contradiction, it's just a paradox. And so I think we humans like things to be simpler than they are, so we tend to retreat and look for easy answers. That sometimes causes us to vote for people we shouldn't vote for. But, um, but it's okay, we can live in these tensions, you know. Uh, these are the two most important words, to have integrity and be original. Integrity means to be consistent and complete, and original simply means true to its origins. The Fogo Island Inn, there's nothing like it on the planet because we didn't copy a Four Seasons or an Amman somewhere. We dug deep into our own home and our own culture, and that's what it gave rise to. I think these two circles are moving together. I think the businesses that are going to do well and endure are the ones that are operated as social businesses. They can be for profit. They're just operated as social businesses. And when you, who, I don't know who you all work for. I'm sure there's a wide variety of employers here. When you go back to work, you should send in a note as a suggestion. Say, are we a social business? And what would it take for us to be a social business? I don't need to convince you of the power of architecture and design. This is the Fogo Island Arts Program. It's a residency-based contemporary art program. I'm not going to dwell on this. We, built, we started with this, the first piece of contemporary architecture that we designed and built. On Fogo Island, we can build anything out of wood. This was uh, an exercise in learning, to, on learning some things to learn how to build anew. Um, and there are four of these studios. 
uh, the caribou have kind of gotten used to this one. They didn't really like it at first. Um, this is how we figured out how to build them. And Todd Saunders, the architect, especially this building, because it's like a piece of origami. He was very complicated drawings. All the local carpenters said, this is impossible to read. What we're going to do is build it the way we build boats. We're going to build a, a scale model, one inch to one foot, and scale it up. So that's what they did. Writer's studio. These are the traditional homes that uh, we've always built. And the artists that come into residence live in those homes that we have restored. Kate Newby. And we have a gallery inside the inn. This is an, and it's a classic white cube gallery, except for the floor. Now you get the relationship between the old and the new. This old building without the new one would make us sad. For what? For people whose lives were lived for nothing. The new one without the old one would be some young upstart architect's idea of beauty. Who cares? Our human selves crave a relationship with time. Architecture and design helps hold us in a relationship with time. That is one of the many jobs that architects and designers have to do. So once we got the studios finished, we decided we're going to tackle the inn, which was a much bigger job. 80% of the money to do this came from my career in technology, but we wanted the governments to participate with us because they have a responsibility to economic development. And so we asked the federal government of Canada for 10% and the government of Newfoundland for 10%, and they eventually came on board. But the first letter we got back said this. <laughs> I came out of the technology world. When someone tells you this, you know you're on the right path. <laughs> and so it's the, 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 be very mistrustful of the normal. And so, it took us seven years to figure out what to build, because it was a conversation across centuries. It took us three years to build it once we got started. It was like a big knitting project. So the inn is 300 feet long and 30 feet wide. It's plausible as a ship. It, it um, is made of wood inside and out with a steel frame. It was made by Fogel Islanders. That's actually Todd Saunders, the architect. Um, and we built it throughout all seven seasons, no matter uh, what the wind was doing. It, you, you get the idea. I can tell you who every one of these men are that worked on this. And as I said, I felt like we knit the inn together. And there it is. It's like um, it's an X. And to me, that is a metaphor for the ends. It's about the past. It's about the future. It's for people who visit from away. It's also for Fogo Islanders. It's traditional and it's contemporary. So... I think we are at our best when we can figure out systems and designs that hold the ends. And if you find yourself stuck in an oar, you probably just need to think about it a little bit longer. Of all the things written about the end, this is the thing that means the most, that it's an act of human culture. It's actually an act of human community. This was terrifying. This came out, obviously, after we built it. We knew it was hard. We never thought it was that daring, but um, I want you to pay attention to this sentence, that the quality of results produced by any system depends on the quality of our awareness. So I want to pause on this for a minute. The quality of our lives, individually and collectively, is the quality of our relationships. We have relationships with objects, too. And the quality of our relationships is the quality of our awareness. We think about this a lot and especially financial awareness. So in my lifetime, this happened. We got labeling on food that tells you what's in it. It started in California, and when it first started, all the big industrial food companies said, oh, this is impossible, it can't be done, the price of cornflakes is gonna be $100, all kinds of crazy things. Anyway, it got done. I don't know why we picked tea. You can see there's nothing in tea. <laughs> it, so we, copy this format, and we do this. For everything we offer for sale, we simply tell you where the money goes. At the moment of purchase. So this happens to be for a stay at the inn. For whatever you spend to stay at the inn, and it's not a small amount of money, 49% of it goes to the people who work there. 
Where else should it go? I can tell you that generally in the hotel industry, that is about 30%. Then we tell you what goes to fees and operations and on and on. We target a 15% profit. Well, in last year, we didn't get there. We got 12%. And then I can tell you geographically where the money goes. So if you're a little tiny community and you get $1, you want to hold on to that dollar and make it move around in your economy. So you can see 69% of it stays on Fogo Island. Imagine when you go out to buy a jacket or anything, you had this information. You could make decisions that lines up the money you spend with your personal values. So the next time you go to buy anything, say to the vendor, do you have the economic nutrition label for this? <laughs> and if they don't, just direct them to our website because this is something we are planning to roll out. Because I'm an accountant, you're not gonna wade through 40 pages of financial statements, which only comes out at the end of the quarter, to figure out where the money goes. This is not that hard to do, we just have to decide. Okay, that was a nice day on Fogo Island. I'll give you a little tour. That's one of the powerful seasons on Fogo Island. You get a sense of place. So when we were building the inn, this is back to this scale problem. How many rooms? The conventional wisdom, the normal thing to do, is to realize you're going to spend a lot of money building a restaurant and kitchens and all the infrastructure. So typically what happens is you hang as many rooms off it as possible to make the business model work. Phyllis Call, who lives on Fogo Island, when we were discussing how many rooms, said, we're only 2,500 people. We can only love so many people at a time. <laughs> so we settled on 30 rooms, and then we realized, well, we can't build 30, because that's not a prime number. So we settled on 29. And, and, and it seems to be the right scale for our community, and it seems to be the right scale for our guests. And so when we tackled, when we had the building sorted out, we tackled the interior. That was actually the hardest, it was harder than the architecture in many ways because we realized we, we wanted to build all this furniture ourselves. We have a long history of building furniture, but you can't take a chair from 1850 and put it in an inn that opens in 2013. And so we started a designer in residence program and invited designers I would say mostly Europeans, to come to Fogo Island and we match them with local artisans and craftspeople and each were given an assignment. And that gave rise to all of the furniture that's at the inn. This fellow was an expert in the historical furniture of Newfoundland. He was an advisor and a critic throughout the whole process. But again, trying to, using objects to hold us in a relationship with the past in a way that holds on to the knowledge most everything that happens on Fogo Island with respect to textiles is women, I have to say. It's a very gender-based in that way. Um, we build small wooden boats. If you can build something like this, you can build anything out of wood. We don't use steaming in the way we build boats. And so you get the idea of these little boats were the workhorses of the inshore fishery. We don't need them for that anymore because we fish further offshore. But now we use them for recreation. And... We work with uh, the artists in residence program and artists that sometimes, I mean, many of the artists are conceptual in their work, but they cross over to craft and design sometimes. I love this woman who really digs into local knowledge, like simple tools. This is three pieces of wood is all you need to build a boat if you know what three pieces to have. This was a typical meeting between local craftspeople and boat builders and the designer. We were like detectives in our own past trying to understand why people did things the way they did them. We argued for three weeks about what is Fogo Island pink? And, and we still disagree whether we got it right. And so you, you get a sense of place. These fishing stages have dots on the door because we didn't have electricity. So when you come down what's called a fishing flake in the nighttime to go to the fishing building, you use these white dots to orient yourself. I mean, this is an example of some of the designs were very direct. These are the lights that are over the bar at the inn. So it's a lovely way of carrying the past in a way that's contemporary. And so we think that's pretty funny that you can always find the bar. Uh, and there, there you go, you see them over the bar. But they, they, that, that is probably the, an example of the most direct derivation of something, the meaning of something traditionally. Elaine Fortens from Montreal, she designed a chair which is probably the rock star in the collection. 
this chair, you get the obvious relationship between the traditional boat and the chair. A chair, besides function and beauty, can help us make meaning if we ask it. Why do we allow so many anonymous objects in our lives? When we come home at the end of a day to a home that is filled up with anonymous stuff, I don't think that helps us make meaning. When we have a choice to choose the things that we allow into our lives, knowing where they came from, from what, from what culture, from what place did they emerge? Who made them? Where did the money go? And I tell you, if we have those kinds of objects in our lives, they're not going to the landfill. And that'll solve some of the other problems that we have to solve. So we should expect a lot from a chair. Okay, a little tour around the end. That's an Inika Hans piece. There's a library. There's a cinema, which is a partnership with the National Film Board of Canada, building on the fact that if it wasn't for the National Film Board in the late 60s, we wouldn't be there. Uh, there's, a, there's a gathering space, conference center. So all the rooms face the North Atlantic. I can tell you, other than the glass, and other than that lamp, which is from Italy, and those binoculars, which are from Germany, everything you see is made on Fogo Island. And that has given rise to a lot of economic activity that has made a big difference to our ability to hold on. Same here, the bathtub came from Montreal. Even though the guys up at the wood shop said, oh, we could make a bathtub, just give us a little longer. It's like, I don't know, I think we're gonna buy the bathtubs. Um, <laughs> it's, but it's this, I, and I have to say, when, when you are a culture of makers, there's something about that that knits people together. And I, I think one of the things that's happened with the digital world and our, the networks we live in is we, we stop being citizens in, sometimes. We go from being citizens to being consumers to being commodities. And so just to be really careful about that. When you are in the community, you're a citizen. I love, we have hot tubs on the roof. That's a lovely time to be in the hot tub. The dining room is like the prow of the ship. And we cook what there is around us. We forge our 26 kinds of edible berries on the island that all are happy to be turned into jams. Um, when we first opened, we served orange juice. And we invited all the community members to come and stay at the inn because they are the beneficial owners and we wanted them to know it and learn from them. And one woman said, she says, all lovely, it's all fine. She said, but why do you serve orange juice? And she was the one who said, we have all those berries. Why, why are they not being turned into juices. So now we don't serve orange juice anymore. But it's another one of these normal things. You think, oh, you know, at high-end property, you're gonna serve orange juice. Well, those oranges come from very far away. Uh, we can grow just about anything, even though the island is a very rocky place. This is one of the most amazing things of design. It's called a root cellar. This is how we keep vegetables through the winter. You don't actually need electricity uh, to keep things warm or to keep them cool. That's the fish I talked about in the beginning, and the happy news is the cod are coming back ever so slowly, because the ocean is warming ever so slightly, but it's enough that a cod knows the difference in a tiny, tiny change in temperature, but signs are good. Um, we, that's our chef, Jonathan Gushu, and, and Sarah, pastry chef, they do a lot of foraging, and you get a sense of food. Uh, we made many, many, many design mistakes in the making of the inn, because none of us had ever done anything like that before. The biggest mistake we made is the dining room was too small. And so we had to build an, a, a sort of mini dining room, which we call a shed, which is outside right next to the inn. And it also, it turned out to be a really wonderful thing, because the food in the dining room is a little, I wouldn't say it's formal, but it's semi-formal, whereas the shed is very relaxed, and it ended up being a good thing. And now we fish for crab, that's crab at the end of the table. And I can tell you, there is no dignified way to eat crab. So you might as well go out to the shed and do it that way. Um, our, our chef is a good chef, which is of course important. What interests me more though is how he uses his skill to bring Fogo Islanders together to talk about what are we eating and what should we be eating in the future. And we used to grow a lot more than we grow now. We are starting to grow locally again, and using the inn as a kind of an electric eel in the pond to just think more carefully about where food comes from. We didn't set out to win awards. We set out to make meaning and economy for our island, but we won lots of awards, which helps. 
The wood shop, we never intended to get in the furniture business, but we made all the furniture, people wanted to buy it, and we're in the middle actually now of a new design initiative with our furniture business. We of course tell you where the money goes. Same thing, everything we sell, that's a little table called a puppy table, we tell you where the money goes. With all of them, you get a sense of the furniture, it's in the cajons again. We designed and make our own hangers. This is where we made the furniture. And I have to tell you, if you grow up in a community, and many people in the world do, that their important public buildings are in disrepair, you do not actually feel very positive about the future. And so we were very determined to fix up as many of these public buildings as we could. This is our furniture shop. Now it looks like this. And I tell you, the day we put up the scaffolding to start fixing this up, people started painting their houses. So it's about what you believe. You, you actually get what you believe. Another restoration project, a punt center. We have a handline cod business. We catch them one by one, and we sell them to lovely restaurants, many in this city. And Austin Reed, this man, he's only ever caught fish one by one. He, does, he, does, he never uses a gill net. We also tell you where the money goes for the fish. And so in this case, I can't actually see it, but I think, yeah, 69% of what we sell this for in Toronto goes back to Fogo Island. I think my father would be very proud of that. And we have a new ocean ethic program, which is too much to talk about, that really is about our relationship with the ocean and having a higher fidelity relationship with the ocean. And collectively, we think what we're doing is turning money into fish. <laughs> and that's what money is for. You all know this is true. The world is suffering from a plague of sameness. This next photograph is not from Fogo Island. Why do we build this? Why do we allow this to be built in our communities? Partly, it's because our human brains overfocus on things we can measure. The payback period on this is probably five years. And in 20 years, it's going to the landfill. I don't agree with Jeff Bezos. I think we do want to see each other. We do need shops. We just have to build them differently. And as citizens, we shouldn't allow anybody to put something in our community that has nothing to do with the community itself. So we can, we can do better than this. I try not to use the word sustainability because it's a little bit like love and community. We don't actually know what we're saying. But I love this quote from Domus Magazine that an acceptance of precariousness is a prerequisite to permanence. And it is precarious. We are in the process of launching a community economics institute to try and put these ideas and, and practices and tools around how do you build strong communities and link them all together. Because I think we, don't, we, do, we collectively have forgotten how. And the, the, the nasty form of globalization that we've set loose on, on the world uh, just needs to be reined in a little bit and money needs to come home and invest instead of running around everywhere. Um, I'm gonna finish with this. We are each and every one of us responsible for the ongoing creation of communities. It's everyday work. What matters is what we do. My father used to say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you feel. I only care what you do. Because it's only what you do that makes any difference to anybody else. And the happy news is everything that everyone does matters a lot. And if you think of the filmmakers from 1968, they thought they were just trying to help the community come together. They had no idea that others would pick up their work. So even if it seems daunting and overwhelming, and you think what little thing you're gonna do is not gonna make a difference, it will get added to what other people do. So always do it. And I'll leave you with this quote from Jane Addams. She won the Nobel Prize in the 30s. She was a housing activist in Chicago that the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. And I think we should design for that. Thank you very much. Give it up for Zena, yeah.